we just had a very long uh, exchange of views uh, with the prime ministers and the president of the institutions. Uh, quite a lot of it was dedicated uh, to the um, uh, criminal proceedings involving the parliament. Uh, and a lot of support uh, was expressed by the Prime Ministers for the way that the Parliament has handled uh, this matter so far. I'll go a little bit into detail. First of all, of course, these criminal proceedings involving the Parliament are damaging. They are damaging for democracy, for Europe, and for everything that we stand for. Trust that has taken years to build but only moments to destroy will need to be rebuilt, and this work starts now. Uh, we need to right the wrongs, and we need to send a powerful message to those external actors who try to undermine us that we will not yield, that we will stand by our values, the rule of law, justice, and due process. Let me once again assure everyone there will be no impunity, there will be no sweeping under the carpet, and there will be no business as usual. As of today, I am putting together a wide-ranging reform package to be ready uh, in the new year. This will include the strengthening of the Parliament's whistleblower protection systems, a ban on all unofficial friendships groups, a review of the policing of our code of conduct rules, and a complete and in-depth look of how we interact with third countries. I will lead this work personally, and in, suing, in doing so, I will, consult both, well, I will consult widely both internally and externally. Before the European Council started today, uh, I, together with the Council President in Office, Prime Minister Fiala and Commission President von der Leyen signed two uh, important declarations. The first, a declaration on digital rights and principles, putting our citizens and hearts at, at values at the heart of the digital transition. Second, the joint declaration on EU legislative priorities for 2023-2024. We committed to deliver on the reform of our energy markets our climate ambitions and to fix our migration and asylum rules that have not worked for years. This is especially important uh, ahead of the 2024 European elections where citizens will hold us accountable for how the European Union has responded to the current challenges. In the meeting with the leaders, I had a very strong message on behalf of the European Parliament on the broken promise that was made 11 years ago to Bulgaria and Romania. This needs to be fixed. There is no justifiable reason not to admit Bulgaria and Romania to the Schengen area. I also raised the current high energy prices, crippling our economy and making it impossible for families and businesses to make ends meet. We need to improve competitiveness and we need to return to growth. And we must do this by sticking to our democratic values and by pursuing our climate agenda. The European Parliament believes that the United States Inflation Reduction Act should provide a platform for further EU-US leadership in climate action, in energy, in security, and for cooperation on the definition of common standards. But one thing is clear, now is not the time for a trade war with our allies. I also welcomed the unblocking of the 18 billion euro financial assistance package for Ukraine, which I signed yesterday following the vote in Parliament. I also called for a quick agreement on the ninth package of sanctions and for the European Union to keep its promise to the Ukrainian people and President Zelensky to hold those responsible for war crimes to account. There can be no peace without justice. Final word, we had quite a long exchange with the Czech Prime Minister on the excellent work done by the Czech Presidency, and I would like to publicly acknowledge that. I do that because what we thought I think was impossible at the beginning of this Presidency has been done. 
When we promised that we would adopt Repower EU before Christmas, we did that yesterday in the early hours of the morning. We unblocked the long-blocked <laughs> migration package by voting on Eurodac earlier this week and by concluding the trialogues on reception and resettlement. This is important because the European Parliament signed a roadmap with the European Council uh, as co-legislators um, uh, going forward in order to finalise this package, which has an impact and a spillover effect even on the Schengen discussion uh, for what our citizens want us to be acting on. This is a legislative area uh, which um, uh, is one that is uh, tangible and that uh, is emotive, but also one that can be addressed by legislation. On Article 122, I reiterated the Parliament's position that the speed and effectiveness with which this Parliament has acted on, on legislation such as on gas storage, but also on Repower EU, does not justify the need to use Article 122, except where uh, it is exceptional uh, and justified. And there was a commitment that was given to me uh, in this uh, regard by the leaders, uh, both of the countries and of the institutions. Thank you, and happy Thank to you. take any questions. Thank you. Questions, please. Yes, you first. Thank you. Uh, hello. <coughs> Robert, Robert Hardman from Good morning. The Daily Mail. Um, can I ask, um, you, you've said that um, European democracy is under attack. Um, strong words. Um, there are those at this summit and officials who have suggested that it's really the European Parliament that's under attack. Is this a credibility issue for all the European institutions? And did you feel that, that, that your sentiment was shared by the leaders that you met today? Well, as you can see also, by, first of all, by the answers uh, that were given uh, by the Prime Ministers on their way in, uh, commending the effectiveness of the way the Parliament uh, has responded to this incident, to this attack. It is not, a, it is not one that stops here, which is why uh, the reforms will need to be made. I also want to clarify that what we are talking about is an investigation that was conducted by the intelligence, law enforcement and judicial authorities of this country, which we have always cooperated with and which we did immediately upon being informed. But at the end of the day, this is also about criminal corruption. And it is about individuals who find themselves in a position, if I can say, where they do not refuse a bag of cash but also in a position where a bag of cash is offered to them. So the strength of my words were inspired by that as well, because the hard work done by the European Parliament made up of 705 members, while yes, overshadowed by what happened, should not take away from the fundamental principles that we hold dear, from the rules that we have already, can be tightened, can be improved, some can be overhauled, but at the end of the day, this corruption was investigated, was uncovered, and was caught. And it was caught because of the fact that there was full and open cooperation and coordination between the services of the Parliament and the authorities in this country, in Belgium, just like why we would with the authorities in every country. Perhaps one word to add is we are also bound by national law in this regard, with regards to, for example, the lifting of privileges and immunities, with regards to how searches are conducted. So perhaps something that we could also look into. I didn't mention the transparency register yet. I hope to be able to get into a little bit of detail, but also in the way our criminal laws on a national level could be better aligned in order to be able to tackle such cross-border allegations, crimes and investigations 
uh, which would help also in terms of the way we respond as an institution, but also as to what we can do as all institutions. I think there was a sentiment in the room that institutions share the need for us to do things properly, uh, and that is something that we will do. Yes, madam, please. Irina Zarakadula with Greek Public TV and Athens News Agency. Hi. Madam President, have you been approached in a suspicious way by Qatar, Morocco, or another third country? And secondly, why should we wait till now, till this huge scandal, before more decisions to close these loopholes in European Parliament uh, could be taken? Thank you. Thank you for this. Um, thanks for using the word loopholes. They are loopholes that can that will be uh, filled uh, if we talk, for example, about the activity of former members of the European Parliament, uh, of uh, who is currently on the transparency register, of uh, who can enter the European Parliament. Now, again, this is a parliament of 705 members, different political groups, different activities. But certain things that happened in this context will not be allowed to happen again. We will have to look at non-governmental organizations that are listed on the transparency register, those that are not, but are used as a front with regards to source of funding, with regards to ways of acting. I was um, asked this question on Qatar uh, three weeks ago uh, on uh, uh, an Italian television program. My answer was this, and it remains true today. I was invited to go to the World Cup. I refused. Uh, I refused because I have concerns about that country. And in every opportunity that I had, I had two meetings with uh, representatives of the Qatar government in Brussels, where I received uh, um, uh, invitations, again, either to attend the World Cup or an open request from the Qataris to address the parliament, which I turned down. Thank you. Next question on this side now, please. Merci, c'est Moussa Asri, Al Mayadin TV, c'est une chaîne de télévision arabe basée à Beyrouth. Euh, Jusqu'à maintenant, Madame la Présidente, on ne sait pas quel est le but euh, de ces pots de vin qatari euh, au sein de, du Parlement. Elle cherche quoi, le Qatar Quelle influence elle voulait de euh, député du de, de, de Parlement Enfin, c'est quoi, quoi le but C'est l'influence dans quel domaine Merci. Thank you. Um... Keeping in mind, you know, legally the fact uh, that there is presumption of innocence that continues to apply uh, until cases are, as we call it, uh, subjudice. Uh, what I would say is, rather than the aims which you will have to ask uh, the investigating authorities, is that we have responded with firmness and immediately with regards to making sure that the opening of the mandate for negotiations on visa liberalization with that country were stopped uh, on Monday, uh, sent back to committee for a full investigation to make sure and to see what kind of and if any interference uh, or pressure, both financial or otherwise, was made on the individual members. Secondly, uh, we're, uh, there are questions that are being put about the EU-Qatar Air Agreement that was uh, signed on the 18th of October 2021. A ratification process still needs to be completed. So once all member states, and if all member states ratify, then the Parliament will be uh, asked to consent to it, will be consulted on this. Uh, this procedure, to be clear, has not yet been initiated. I am in contact with the members of the European Parliament responsible 
uh, on this uh, specific uh, topic, but also that the Parliament will be in contact with the Commission's Director General move to decide how to proceed with EU Qatar aviation relations. I give you these two specific examples because this is um, uh, the country that has been mentioned in the, in the um, uh, public information given by the Belgian authorities. But what I can also say is that we will look into everything. We will look into any uh, undue pressure and any undue influence that we see that takes place. Next question. Yes, please. Jennifer. Thank you. I'm Jennifer Rankin at The Guardian. Good morning. Good morning. Could you uh, elaborate, please, on the timing of the reform package that you mentioned? How quickly do you think this can be introduced and completed? And secondly, on third countries, you, you mentioned Qatar, which is at the center of this case. Do you have concerns that there are other third countries exerting undue influence? How, could you name those third countries? And how wide do you think this issue goes? Thanks a lot. On the timing, um, there are different levels uh, of, uh, of decision-making in the Parliament and different bodies that take, take decisions. So to give you just one example, uh, when it comes uh, to, taking to taking decisions of banning certain um, uh, individuals, etc., from entering the Parliament, that is a decision that I take, uh, but it is also a decision that is shared with the other institutions. So uh, on the occasion of Russia's invasion of Ukraine on the 24th of February, we got together uh, and essentially at each and every approval of a sanctions package with the Council and the Commission in order to make sure uh, that similar treatment is, is, is affected across all institutions for individuals or representatives to enter the building. That's one example of a decision that can be taken uh, with immediacy. I can also give you an example that uh, yesterday um, uh, an NGO called No Peace Without Justice, which allegedly is, is uh, um, um, connected to this investigation that is ongoing, which had 11 accre persons accredited on it, was suspended. Uh, these are measures that will be taken um, in an accruing manner as the hours come ahead of us. There is a growing uh, request and has been for a while for investigation into unofficial friendship groups. What do these friendship groups do? These friendship groups are a group of members uh, and by no means am I saying that, uh, that, that I can allege illegalities there, but they are, they sh there, there is not enough monitoring. There is not enough control. There is not enough control on uh, who pays for any travel, even though there is a, a, an obligation to declare. There is not enough control on what you receive in, on certain trips, etc. Again, this is without prejudging anything or anyone but if there is a loophole there, I want to close it. I also want to make sure that the official uh, interlocutors of the European Parliament with third countries are the ones that remain official. In other words, that if we are dealing with a third country, it is those, those members of a committee or the senior members of a delegation that are being the official interlocutors of the institution. This is important because I, I think that there is a lot of work to be done there in terms of effectiveness and transparency. I would like to see a new mandatory transparency register of all meetings with any third country actor by members of the European Parliament or assistance and a new sanction regime to ensure compliance. This will require um, uh, decisions to be taken by the senior bodies of the Parliament. When we talk about access to the building, but also for former members. I will need to look into kind of badges that are associated with former members who use their former membership status to lobby for anything or anyone or any country. We have a code of conduct that looks into um, uh, conduct of members of the European Parliament. 
but also we have a process whereby if you have information that can be given securely and anonymously, um, that will be more, let's say, that will be structured. And there will be a strengthening of a whistleblower protection system. We have it for other areas uh, in the Parliament um, of uh, a personal nature, but we should have it also on this. On the declaration of financial interests, a thorough review will be done again on each and every member of the European Parliament. There's an obligation by each member upon election, but should be amended to reflect your income. And on the, the declaration of what you receive and who you meet, there will be a, 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 a list, an enforced list of obligations for members of the European Parliament. But again, this is, we're talking about a small number of individuals that seek to undermine. We're also talking about third party influencers. I want to really put trust in those members that spend all night on a trialogue in order to make sure that a huge uh, energy or climate bill gets through. And that's my role, to make sure that that responsibility is protected and that work is lauded. Because we, that is really what has been done actually over the past few weeks uh, and months. And if I can say, looking back to the date of my election, I have been extremely impressed with the high number of work that members of the European Parliament do with such responsibility as co-legislators. Please, Madam, the third floor uh, row, please. Alla Ahmed Hemken von Rodal Nachrichtensender. Ähm, meine Frage an, an Sie, Frau Präsidentin, ähm, betrifft ganz, ganz andere Frage, und zwar die Angriffe der Türkei auf die kurdischen Gebiete in Syrien. Die Kurden, meine ich, die gegen IS gekämpft haben für ganz Europa. Das, was dazu führt, dass viele jetzt sich auf dem Fluchtweg machen. Was kann das Europäische Parlament tun? Zweite Frage wäre, viele Menschen, viele Demonstranten werden jetzt, vor allem die Kurdinnen, werden im Iran zum Tode verurteilt. Was ist Ihre Position? Vielen Dank. Could you repeat the first question, please? The first question, the second question I got. Meine erste Frage betrifft die, die Angriffe der Türkei auf den kurdischen Gebieten in Syrien. Und was dazu führt, dass die Kurden natürlich flüchten müssen. Und ein Flucht und Migration ist ein großes Thema in Europa. Dankeschön. Ja, yeah, okay. Thank you for this. Excuse me for, for not having heard the first question first. So on, uh, there are many members of the European Parliament that have been uh, raising this issue for a while. Um, I, I think if I look back uh, uh, this year, uh, we have focused a lot on, on, our, on the crisis that we are managing. So first we had the pandemic and then we had the, the war, the energy crisis and the economic recovery. What I do not want is for that to take away from the, another fundamental role of the European Parliament, which was that for insisting with all our partners, neighbours, countries we have agreements with, countries we negotiate with, countries we invest in, uh, not to abide by each and every rule that we have. And that includes Turkey, and that includes the treatment of Kurds and representatives of different um, groups and minorities that find or seek to find refuge in our countries. On Iran, what we are seeing is unprecedented, if I can say, in my lifetime, uh, we can commend the courage, the bravery of what has become now synonymous with our chant of women, life, liberty. We continue to call for free and fair elections. We welcome the sanctions. We call for more. But we also need to send a message that we are with the people and the protesters on the street. We did this in the, in the European Parliament this week as well. <laughs> um, uh, but I think we should be stronger and louder. I also will seek to create an inter-parliamentary 
um, platform on this with my, uh, my colleagues, uh, G7 presidents of the parliament. Uh, we have already similar platforms on, on, on Ukraine uh, following Russia's invasion. We have similar platforms whether, when it comes to uh, gender equality, women's rights, minority protection. I think we should do this specifically on this, and I will, uh, I will be launching that in the coming days. Okay, a couple of uh, questions more. Yes, please. They keep increasing. <laughs> Lorne Cook from the Associated Hi, Press. Hi, um, I want to acknowledge, I know it's difficult to talk about certain elements uh, of this investigation. Uh, you said in front of the, the leaders, I understand, you, you spoke of authoritarian governments trying to subdue the processes uh, of the parliament. It goes a little bit to Jennifer's question. Can you tell us a little more about authoritarian governments, what that means, two, three more names? Um, and the second part of it, subdue processes. I know you've suspended, you've said you've suspended the visa arrangement, uh, the, the, the skies agreement and so on. It, are there legislative files that you feel are compromised uh, so far that are already in place perhaps? Thank you. On the last question, uh, I have asked uh, for a review uh, of what uh, has been voted on uh, and, uh, and worked on. Uh, no, I have no information uh, in any way on that. Also because when you look at uh, the, the, um, the, the, what the, um, uh, when we look at what uh, has been done in terms of legislation uh, in, uh, in the past weeks and months has really been the unblocking uh, in order to make sure that we proceed on what the citizens have asked for us. So I mentioned migration files specifically, I mentioned energy files. We have a huge climate files that are being renegotiated right now and will be voted on at the beginning of the year. So I really must really put um, uh, an emphasis on, on the good work that done there. Uh, with the leaders, while not um, uh, telling you word for word what was said, when we talk about um, authoritarian um, or autocratic regimes uh, that could use or allegedly use uh, non-governmental organizations as a front, that is something that I think we should all look at, all. Uh, and uh, that's what I asked for, that everybody looks at that. Um, but I also refer to when we talk about subduing the process, for example, on what happened only three weeks ago when the parliament um, uh, was attacked because we, of a resolution calling Russia a state sponsor of terrorism. Uh, and there we saw an immediate response with the largest attack ever seen on our services, uh, on our system, sorry, and which our services works for hours to retrieve and, 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 and secure, to be clear. Uh, I also wanted to, give, to take a moment to, 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 to give a shout out to actually our services, our, our safety services, uh, which have worked day and night since uh, the news broke, but also uh, on uh, our IT services um, in view uh, from a cybersecurity point of view of the vulnerability of our institution, a specific vulnerability that, our, I mean, let's say a risk profile that our institution has because it is made up of 705 members who are active, who are loud in a good way, who are vocal, who fight for causes, who are the first sometimes to push a cause. We were the first to call for Ukraine and Moldova to join the European Union. We were the first parliament to give President Zelensky a platform to address uh, and use parliamentary diplomacy for the best thing it could be used for in order to counter misinformation and propaganda, after which I asked 160 parliaments to do the same, and more than, I think, 120 responded. So uh, when we're talking about the subduing of processes, this is not something new. Uh, it will continue, uh, but it is something that we will work uh, from a political point of view, but also, secondly, from a... Uh, security cooperation point of view. Uh, beyond that, I, I cannot comment on, on other countries. Maybe the last two questions. Yes, please, here. 
Hi, Dave Keating, Friends 24. Hi, Dave. I was wondering if you could just clarify something. I know you're limited in what you can say in terms of the investigation, but you noted that parliamentary officials have been working with the police on this. Did the parliamentary officials find out about this and alert the police, or did the Belgian police find out and alert the parliament officials? What I would say is that they are in constant back and forth conversations. Uh, the investigation was held in tandem, but the information reached me on the 9th of December in the morning. But I would also say, I mean, you know, we do not have a European FBI. We do not have police officers inside the parliament. So we act on instruction when we are asked to act. And in this case, we acted immediately. Immediately, which also involved not only the sealing of offices, the lifting of immunity where there had to be, that had to be lifted, uh, the decisions that had to be taken uh, in order to proceed with the searches, but also, for example, uh, the requirement uh, of me um, to be present as required by Belgian law at the House search of a Belgian member of the European Parliament. Uh, that is to say that there was no moment at which uh, the Parliament was asked or informed of something, that that question was not answered, or that instruction was not done, or that cooperation did not happen. If at each and every, whether physical, political or legal step that we had to take. Yes, please, last question. Hi, uh, Max Delaney, AFP. Hi, Max. You, you hinted at the, at, at the issue and skirted around it a bit, but will you now ban uh, representatives of Qatar or any other government implicated in this uh, corruption scandal from the premises of the European Parliament? Thanks. That is one of the questions I would put to the Conference of Presidents immediately. That's how, that's how decisions are taken, that's how they were taken um, uh, throughout the, my mandate and tenure as, uh, as uh, um, uh, President of the European Parliament. Uh, but I can also tell you that our um, security and our, our um, individuals involved are, are very much alerted to the fact that they will have to take quick action on entry. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks.